Hey, snackers. You may have heard about full stack observability, but have you heard of full snack observability? In this special DevNet Create episode of Snack Minute, developer advocate Quinn Snyder will demonstrate how he has used streaming telemetry concepts and open source tooling, along with some handy APIs to achieve perfect data-driven outcomes and delicious meal results. Hey everyone, Matt DiNapoli here. I'm a manager of developer advocacy with Cisco DevNet. Hello, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a tech advocate with Cisco Learning and Certification. And welcome to episode 42 of DevNet Snack Minute. DevNet Snack Minute is your weekly 10-minute all things DevNet, giving you a quick, fun way to learn about Cisco APIs, coding, and just some cool stuff that you want to know. And in this special episode, we're going to be learning about meat-driven telemetry. And if you're wondering what that means, uh, stay tuned because we're going to talk to Quinn Snyder, who's been with us before. Um, so we'll have him introduce himself, though. But uh, Quinn, are are you are you there, Quinn? Quinn. Uh, hello. Hey guys, sorry, I, you you caught me at a really bad time. I'm actually out here getting ready to put some meat on the on the smoker. Um, and actually, for those of you who don't know, my name is Quinn Snyder. I'm a developer advocate with Cisco DevNet. Oh, hey Quinn. Looks like uh, I'm kind of jealous. Um, yeah. You know, I think. Kareem, I think we should come out and go go grill with Quinn I too. Be what do you think? Right now too, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, let's, let's join him. Up. Yeah, we'll put on our aprons and join him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these aprons really are killer. A little warm in the Phoenix heat for sure. Quinn, tell us a little bit about your setup here and uh, and kind of give us an introduction to what what you called meat driven telemetry. I'm I'm intrigued. <laughs> yeah. So what I, what I'm doing here is actually am. Um, uh, I've taken my my monitoring of my smoker and my barbecue to kind of the next level. Um, I, I was dissatisfied with some of the built-in controls and probes on the, uh, the the unit that I have itself, and so I I bought a third-party unit that has a cloud API. And just like every good developer, oh, if there's cool. an API out there, I'm going to use it. Um, and and really, what I've done is I've instrumented this uh, uh, third-party unit in the cloud API to uh, ingest that data into a typical telemetry TIG stack. So Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana. And I'm using that to correlate not only the temperatures of what's going on inside of the smoker uh, and the meat itself, but also gathering external data from like the National Weather Service. Because uh, if you haven't been to Phoenix, it's an experience in the summer. Uh, it's very hot and humid. It's not necessarily a dry heat. <laughs> Uh, but in the obviously, but in the winter, uh, we have extremely dry weather. And so I've noticed that that was changing how long it took me to, to cook all of these different uh, uh, barbecue meats that I make. And I wanted to be able to prove that out with uh, data telemetry. Nice way, way to put the APIs in action to, to get your, uh, your meat going, right? It'd be absolutely <laughs> perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely perfect. Because if you remember, uh, the last snack minute, I was talking about making sure that my barbecue never was bad and that we'd be making snacks for the next snack minute. So this is a kind of the culmination of, of coming true on my promise there. Why don't you uh, head inside and actually uh, cool off a little bit, um, unless there was something you wanted to show us uh, out here before, before you head back in? No, let me just get this on the smoker, and then I will go ahead and we'll jump back in and get to some of the details and show all the neat dashboards and stuff. Uh, Sweet. That'd be awesome. Thanks, Quinn. Perfect. See, see, see you guys in a few. Quinn, that was awesome. Okay, talk to us a little bit about what's happening under the hood. Um, I'm just excited to see just the APIs in action and of what's talking to what. Yeah, so this is, um, I mean, it, it, it's just like any other normal monitoring stack that we have for any model-driven telemetry. But like I said, I wanted to spice it up a little bit, both figuratively and literally <laughs> with the uh, <laughs> um, and and. Uh, make it focused on on barbecue. So like I said, I have this specific third party temperature probe monitoring unit that has cloud APIs. 
Um, luckily, I, I didn't have to do a ton of heavy lifting here because someone by the name of, of Scott Anderson at Influx actually created some of the handlers to pull some of that data in. It is just a REST API, but he made a real handy click, a point you click to make that part of the data collection pretty easy. So I'm ingesting those things in from in, uh, from the cloud into InfluxDB, and I'm also pulling in information from the National Weather Service. Uh, luckily, I live between two airports that are National Weather Service stations about three miles on either side of me. So I have fairly accurate data on things that I care about, namely ambient temperature and uh, dew point for humidity in, in the air. The, the third piece of it that's kind of denoted by that Raspberry Pi icon is, is kind of some future work that I want to do to measure the humidity inside of the smoker box itself. Um, the challenge there is the, the high temperature uh, humidity sensors are few and far between, and so I've got to figure out how I can connect those leads to a RasPi and then shove that data in flux as well. So once that data is in influx into different data buckets, then I can do some things and, and query it. So down on the bottom below the influx, I have the influx database dashboard, which has some handy things that again, Scott had designed for like determining whether the meat's stalling or things like that. Kind of kitschy, I haven't uh, really played with the settings to customize it for my use case because uh, ironically enough, the, the influx version that I'm running doesn't seem to render very well on mobile, and I'm usually either on my phone or on my iPad when I'm around the house checking on these things. So I use the Grafana piece a lot. Uh, but I've duplicated a lot of that same data by using Grafana to pull that data from influx and then visualize it in the Grafana dashboard as well. Now, have you run into any challenges with the uh, actual structure of the data, like the timestamps or maybe how the temperature settings go? Do you have to do any conversions to, to make it all look nice and pretty in Grafana? Yeah, so um, it's it's funny that you say that. And let me jump over here to the actual uh, terminal window here. So this is using using the the telegraph inputs. We can see that I'm I'm just testing the input for the fireboard itself, which is the third party unit. And we can see we're getting stuff in Fahrenheit, which is very easy to 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 kind of visualize and 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 put together for those of us who live in in the United States. Everywhere else, you know, probably looks at us like why are we using the system still, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> the, the, yep. the the problem that I ran into is the National Weather Service. And so you can see I've got three different buckets here. I've got one from uh, an airport uh, on one side of me KCHD and I have another one that's uh to the uh see so that was to the west of me. This one's to the east of me is is KIWA. Both of those happen to have their values in um, Celsius. So you can see here, this temperature value is 31 degrees. Well, that's obviously Celsius. So I have to do some conversion there. Uh, so being able to, to take and normalize all these data pieces and figure out what the key values are, what are the things that I care about, and then normalize them inside of the data is was kind of the, the hardest part as, as well as like, how do I use the, the National Weather Service API, which is something that I've never honestly never had to deal with in my in my life. Um, ironically enough, for the uh, for the humidity sensors that I'm looking at, they also measure uh, temperature and humidity in in Celsius as well. So rather than having to convert that on the fly inside of the dashboard, which I think slows down the rendering just a touch, uh, there's actually Python libraries that I can use to convert things like relative humidity into dew point and being able to, to convert temperatures from uh, Celsius into Fahrenheit right on the Raspberry Pi. So that's something I'm going to incorporate in kind of phase two of this whole piece. How long do you refresh your data from your temperature sensor? So the third party unit itself actually is a pretty robust API and I can uh, convert that. Uh, it refreshes, I think the maximum is like 600 times an hour. So it's refreshing about every 10, 15 seconds or so. So I get fairly granular values here. You can see as these values start clicking along these data points here uh, for the meat that I just put on, we're looking at 954.10, 954.20. So it's, it's refreshing about every 10 seconds, which is really granular, almost too granular when it comes down to it. The National Weather Service stuff, they have a hard limit. They look at your IP address and say, if you're querying it more than, I think it's about 200 times an hour, uh, they'll cut you off or you have to pay for it. So I'm, I'm refreshing that about once every five minutes, I believe is the refresh time. The values don't change that drastically from, from minute to minute, uh, but I'm really looking to show temperature values and, and change over the duration of the cook more, uh, more so than like individual points in time. But the interesting part about this is that you have to take the, into consideration a differing values in, in their measurements, how often you have to worry about the API calls occurring, which is something that we still even have to worry about um, in the traditional sense that we talk about network management, network monitoring, application monitoring, all that stuff. Even though we're talking about meat, 
driven telemetry, those same concepts still come into play um, in dealing with our, our application and network infrastructure. Um, so that's it's a cool lesson to learn in, a, in an interesting space here. Well, two things I wanted to ask you, Quinn. Um, are, one, where can I get my hands? Is this project available anywhere for me to, to just implement on my side? And two, um, what, how much coding did you have to do in order to get all of that connected? Or was, it, was a lot of it pointing and clicking and setting up webhooks? Uh, so the, the code itself, I need to package up the dashboards and things like that. I've, I've really been focused on trying to put this all together. I really want to make this kind of a project, kind of a fun thing to, to go along uh, so that people can follow along at, at home. Um, so that I, I plan on, on putting some of this together and documenting in some way, shape or form so that people can download the dashboards and kind of show the, see the work that I was uh, doing with it. In terms of the code itself, if you've played with Telegraph, it's, it's fairly... I don't want to call it no code, but it's very low code. You just have to understand TOML files uh, and how to the, the different pieces that I need to organize, like for the for the especially for the NWS uh, uh, API calls, being able to organize and say what's my refresh timer, what are the values that I'm pulling out, what are some keys that I'm looking at. Um, because both of these APIs, both of the third party unit as well as with um, the National Weather Service, are very well defined and designed. So good API design is really what enabled me to do this. The the timestamps and everything was all in, in uh, Zulu time or, or UTC. So it was very easy to gather that out and put that all together into the dashboard. Um, so really it was the total files and then understanding data normalization and how do we put these different parts together and, and what are the keys that we're looking at. Um, probably the, the toughest part, and I can kind of show an example here is in FluxDB 2.0, there is a requirement to learn what they call influx or FluxQL. So this query to, to get the information out of the buckets of data inside of influx was probably the hardest part, especially when it mm -hmm. comes to like making sure I want to have the right output value in this chart here. Instead of it being um, you know, some long string, I wanted it to display the certain value that I wanted to see that. Um, that was probably the hardest part. The nice piece of it is, is that Influx actually has in their um, data builder, if I go to the buckets here, and I'll just pick on uh, one of my weather stations here. If we pick out and say we want to look at dew point value here, which is something that that I, I'm concerned about, we can point and click and build all this together. And then I can open up the script editor that will show me a rough cut of that code. So it's not 100% complete because this is visualizing instead of influx and Grafana has some other parameters that need to be normalized, but that got me probably 85% of the way there to the visualizations that I wanted. So it wasn't uh, a huge barrier to entry, but it was really frustrating, especially um, considering the documentation is mostly for old influx and not new influx. Finding that uh, the documentation around uh, flux QL was a little bit of a, um, was a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, and and for me, I've I've had that similar challenge, Quinn. And coming from a relational database or NoSQL background, thinking about time series databases is is kind of challenging as well. Um, so I, that is a a lesson that is much appreciated by I'm sure the entire community. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think the other thing for me here is, and I think Matt touched on this is, um, it's not about you know, we're connecting a meat sensor to this, right? But if you look at your automation journey and you're looking at how to read the, you know, the, the CPU temperature from your, your switches or you're looking at telemetry from your network, the same basic logic applies where you can see that you can utilize these tools in your, for your advantage to build a nice dashboard that you can just look at and see what's happening within your infrastructure, right? So it's not just about the meat. The meat is cool and fun, and the barbecue is cool and fun. But you know, there's also um, um, tools that you can leverage here. Yeah, and I think that's that's the other important part of all this. Is you know, I started off with the built-in sensors and the smoker, and then found out that those weren't adequate, and then bought a third-party tool and was using that for several um, cooks that I had, and it worked fine. It's just there was other pieces of data that I wasn't able to get from that that I was thought was important and and hope to prove out uh, when it cools off and dries out here in the winter, and that's kind of a lesson for that that to your point the automation journey it's it doesn't have to be everything all at once we we get wrapped around the axle of oh i've got to have all of these different parts and pieces 
be an iterative journey and it can be a mix of something that we buy off the shelf. You know, we pay some vendor to, to, to supply this tool that gives us a lot of data that we can visualize using that, but also is open enough where we can extract that same data via APIs and put it into some other dashboard that also contains other relevant information that we found as we've monitored our, monitored our infrastructure or applications at a tighter level. So it's an ongoing process. I mean, you saw that I'm, I'm looking to incorporate a Raspberry Pi there. That's going to be something that's completely bespoke um, with the code, but it's it's a journey. As you start visualizing more and more of your infrastructure or more and more of your meat, you find out that there's these little blind spots and that's where you spend your time and iterate on to, to fix that more so than I have to do all of this stuff all at once. I love how we tied grilling, barbecuing to automation journeys and coding. Snackers, enjoy the rest of DevNet Create. Um, Quinn, I'm hoping we get to see the end result of what we just put together here. And um, thank you so much for all your efforts and, and the work you've done here. Oh, and before we let you go, Snackers, you might have noticed we have some special edition Snack Minute gear. Um, you can go and check that out and pick it up at uh, developer.cisco.com slash devnetcreate and look for the special offers on that page. And you can uh, be sporting some cool aprons and other DevNet Snack Minute gear just like us. Thank you, Snackers. Okay, so our... Barbecue has uh, finally hit temperature, so I'm going to go ahead and remove it. I love the smell of data-driven outcomes. Happy cooking, snackers.